welcome to uh, lesson 12 of the A-Level Germany course. Um, last lesson we looked at the context for the consolidation of power. What that means is um, we looked at that, how to make sense of the question um, and how to sort of understand what it's asking. It's often This is a question that students often get wrong and particularly in their paragraph selection. Um, what we're looking this way is what happened. Now it's very easy to get tempted to do four paragraphs on four things that they do during the consolidation of power. But that is not the question. The question is either how effective was the consolidation of power or more commonly why did he get away with it? Why was he able to take these steps? And so it's very important to remember what I'm looking at today is more of the story that you use as the evidence in your analysis. Say you say fear of communism you might use the Reichstag fire decree for example as opposed to having a paragraph on the Reichstag fire decree. Likewise, the um, you might have the Knights of Long Knives is a as much about Hitler's skillful use of propaganda uh, and the enduring powers of the elites as it is his own factor. factor. So the first thing to remember for those two major questions, how successful was the consolidation of power and more importantly, why did he get away from it, is to think about well, who is the um, consolidation of power consolidating for. If you remember by 1933 in January, Hitler has come to power as Chancellor but is yet to be a Fuhrer. Now this is a sort of arbitrary distinction we can make and this is as much a rhetorical one as anything else. However, it is well worth thinking in these terms. He is someone in a position of power but he really doesn't have much control. He's certainly not a real dictator. Um, he can be stopped by a large number of groups, uh, not large groups of individuals, speak groups that we looked at last time and what we're going to look at is through various stages and various steps and various actions he slowly reduces the ability of some of these to um, remove him or to challenge him the ones he can't politically afford to he either waits for them to die like Hindenburg or he buys them off um, for example the elites and the army um, and so what we're looking at essentially is between 19, uh, 1933 and 1934 and if you ever see a question which says by 1934 um, or how far did Hitler secure power by 1934, how far did Hitler consolidate power by 1934, how much did he, was he in power by 1934, you know it's not a come to power question, it's a consolidation of power question. But by August 1934, um, how far has he a got control of these and how did he get away with it and essentially what it is is a series of actions now you'll recognize this from the um, handout I give you uh, those of you following along at home this is from the best textbook on this course which is the Height and Hinton SHP um, Nazi Germany um, textbook by far and away the most detailed for the facts um, uh, textbook of this range these are all the things that he does the question is not pick three of these at random and explain them the question is how was he able to do these things it was through terror he was able to get these through through propaganda fear of communism or the elites hit his personal skill he was able to justify these get these bully these through and so while I'm going to be talking through the major ones of these this sheet that you were given if you're in my class um, is your best friend and remember this what we're doing here is basically farming the evidence and also trying to help us understand what our major factors are going to be which is what we're going to look at next lesson so let's start first things first um, Hitler decides that he needs a greater majority um, currently he does even with um, his uh, DMVP um, friends he does nowhere near a supermajority. Now, a supermajority is when you have two thirds of the Reichstag. Why does he need two thirds? Because in order to, ch to change the constitution of the Weimar Republic, according to that constitution, you need a two thirds majority in the Reichstag. And therefore, you can change the constitution. For example, change the constitution to get rid of the Reichstag, change the constitution to make a Fuhrer, change the constitution to give someone like Hitler a huge amount of power. So Hitler sees a very quick route to getting to power by getting a two-thirds majority. However, if you remember, he currently only has 33% of, um, uh, well, 33.6% 33 of the Reichstag. Um, with his DMVP allies, it's, he falls far short of what he needs. So he asks the president, the president Hindenburg to fit, call another election which is fixed for March 1933 and that sort of bubbles away and, and sort of he campaigns for that bearing in mind in between there and then we're going to have a couple of things about the Reichstag fire. 
He also needs to start very quickly getting the elites on the side. And there are two very, very important meetings he holds. One on the 3rd of February, one on the 20th of February. The one on the 3rd of February, he has a meeting with all the army chiefs. Bearing in mind, he comes about at the end of January. This is one of the first things he does. He um, speaks to the army and essentially says they will be kept independent from politics. They will not be asked to crush Congress. That's the essays and the police job. They will be left alone and they will be allowed to do their own thing and they'll be given more than that. They'll be given loads and loads of money, loads and loads of pay raises, loads and loads of rearmament and they'll also be given a job to do. I giving the, the army chiefs everything they wanted. The armies did not like being seen as a sort of glorified police force. It tarnished the sort of reputation and the honour of the proud Prussian militaristic Juncker order. And so in reality... Um, uh, the this is a, a bribe. This is material interest. This is something essentially to say, I'll leave you alone and I'll give you lots of free stuff. And essentially, this is not Hitler bullying him. This is not Hitler bullying the army. This is not Hitler destroying the army. This is Hitler realizing that if he tries to take on the army, particularly now, they will, they've got the guns. They'll win. So instead, he's having to play nice. He's having to be a nice sort of uh, coordinator. He's having to be a, a sort of friend, or at least uh, an ally, if not a friend, um, rather than anything else. It also helps that the uh, Nazi minister for war um, uh, was a um, general himself. Um, and actually, he was a sympathizer of Nazi, not a Marx Party member. So the army look at a situation where they've got this guy in, they didn't necessarily trust him, but the guy in charge of the Ministry of War, i.e. the Minister of Defence, um, is one of theirs. He's a general. Um, and, but he's reassuring them that he has control and he's got an eye on the Nazi they can be trusted. Hitler comes along and says, I'll give you everything you want and you don't have to do anything for it. And you know in your back pocket, if worse than worse, you can always just remove him later. And you've still got Hindenburg in charge, so that will be fine. So ultimately, it's all win at this point. You're not costing anything because you can always remove him later. He does a very similar step with the um, industrialists. He says that um, uh, obviously the industrialists were somewhat scared that um, the Nazis with their national socialism and particularly the SA um, sort of big words and big shoutiness um, he, they were scared that perhaps they would uh, the Nazis would try and change capitalism or move to a corporatist models that the Italians were going to corporatism is this idea where the government basically brings a state so it brings the um, uh, the sort of capitalists, the industries and the workers together and negotiates on their behalf, basically acting as an intermediary that's not something that the industrialists particularly like because it basically means that they have less freedom to do what they want um, he by all accounts does a good job of persuading them and very quickly 3 million marks find them, um, of donations, um, find them way into party funds in time for this election in 1933 and so again what he's doing, he's not bullying them, he's not attacking them, he is negotiating through them um, and that's uh, something very important to remember there's sort of this that image that Hitler's this big powerful person who wants to kill everyone it might be his intent to sort of use force if he can but he's smart enough to know at least at this stage when he can't so what he does is essentially he um, starts with the key power bases starts shoring up his support of them to reduce their ability of, to present opposition he then starts um, Pushing his agenda, pushing his message to German people in anticipation of this 19, this um, March 1933 election, and essentially he's he presents himself as a, a national rejuvenation, national uprising, talking about how Hitler will bring re, reverse the future of Versailles, will bring the German people back to the former glory, will deal with the sort of sickness at the heart of Germany, which is the, the culture, the communism, and so on. Um, that stuff, by the way, is designed to get moderates like Catholics and general conservatives rather than Nazis. If you you say I'm going to give Volta mine shaft, that's not going to massively help people. But if you say I'm going to deal with the communists, I'm going to deal with the sort of corrupt Weimar culture, blah blah blah, that's going to really design appeal to all the forces of political and social conservatism, not just your um uh your your base. And if you're going to get two thirds of what you need to go broader. And so what Hitler's trying to do is trying to create an electoral coalition between all those on the right and centre right of Germany who have felt that Germany has politically, morally, culturally, socially lost its way. Um, and this is supported in part by um, the official position of Goebbels being placed as the head of the ministry, right ministry of public enlightenment and propaganda, using his talents, which were up until that point, using party funds and using party organisation, now having the, the money and more importantly the connections and the ability to make people do stuff that a government ministry has. However, in that time, Hitler has seen um, an opportunity. 
On the 27th of February, the Reichstagbrunnen was set on fire by a young Dutch communist. There's a lot of conspiracy theories. Did he do it? Did he not? Um, to some extent, it doesn't really matter um, because Hitler plays it beautifully. He says that this is the trigger, the symbol of a um, uh, uprising that was going to happen, that there's going to be a revolution, that the forces of communism, realising the threat they're under, have decided to rebel. This is not true. There were communists. There were communists who wanted to be revolutionary. There were, the Communist Party was never organised, as you shall see, never really organised enough to really ever really threaten um, any uh, violence of this sort. Um, however, Hitler makes a massive push um, uh, through propaganda and through appealing to uh, Hindenburg that there needs to be emergency. The key sort of emphasis is emergency temporary laws to deal with this sudden um rise of communism now we look at this with hindsight and know he's going to use this for his own ends but we have to remember the average German is far more scared of communism than they are of Nazism and remember Hindenburg and the elites always think at the worst comes worst we can always remove him later yeah we've hired him we can fire him and so Hindenburg provides the law of protection of the German state which essentially says that um, for certain people um, you can temporarily, and this law is temporarily, if given the government, the power to deny civil liberties. Civil liberties are power, right to a fair trial, right for um, evidence before your arrest, the right to a lawyer, right against certain types of torture. Essentially, it's sort of rights that which, which the Nazis said hurt, hurts the government's attempts to try and catch and detain communists. This was sold as an emergency and temporary. This is not people giving Hitler power forever. Um, Hitler, in order to get this passed, has to really persuade it as an emergency and temporary thing, and therefore it's less alarming to people to Hindenburg and the elites. Um, however, as soon as he gets it, Hitler will never repeal this. He'll always have an emergency situation. First it's communism, then it's the war, then it's the Russians and so on. And so the Nazis have legally given themselves terror power and the power to arrest and the power to bully um, uh, the Communist Party. And Hitler exploits it well. And essentially what ends up happening is there is a campaign of legal, technically, because it follows the law, and that's very important to the centre, right, the illusion of legality, um, uh, a push against communism. It's really important that Hitler only uses these powers against the um, communists and to some extent the senior SPD because although he has been given the legal powers the 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 reason Hindenburg the elites the Catholics the sort of centre-right you know consensus have given him the power and agreed to him having this power and keeping this power is because they believe he's going to use against communists. If he just starts you know, imprisoning Prussian Junkers, very quickly he's going to find himself under threat and probably over t overthrown. And so, in reality, although he has this wide power, he's actually limited in how he can use it. But he realises that if he uses it extensively against communists, he justifies that he needs it, uh, and therefore he's more likely to keep it, more likely to get more power. But in addition... He um, was, um, it helps him set a brand. Remember, he's campaigning for the March 13, 1933 election. He needs to sell himself as something. And the one thing that unites the Junkers, the Catholics, the center right, is, and Hindenburg, is a hatred of communism. And so he uses this as a means to sort of channel these sort of energies of the SA, who are starting to lose a bit of patience, into beating up communists and also to make try and set a brand and so in prussia goering who's the uh, minister without portfolio and the ember of responsibilities towards prussia um arose an extra five uh, fifty thousand to the police um all of whom were sa and ss members the kpd leader was arrested as were a large number of um uh, kpd members some S senior sbts as well as that um the um, uh, police also gain the power because of this to detain suspects for an indefinite period of time. They do not have to release them. And the Goebbels corporate don't try and hide this. They try and sell this as this is strong, culturally authoritarian action against communists. Remember, the whole narrative, which kind of got hit into power, was that the, uh, the Weimar democracy was too weak to deal with the problems that Germany faced. And this is Hitler really showing the German people, look, I'm able to deal with this. I'm able to get stuff done. And therefore, we see it's a huge range of... Um, uh, arrests against quote-unquote communists into protected custody. It's important to realise the vast majority of these, these people only um, uh, do this for, only are in prison for a couple of weeks, sometimes months. Very few spend more than a year after being arrested. But the point of these this violence is to really break up 
um, the Communist Party reduce its ability to be a threat um, and also create this atmosphere of conformity. Now we're going to talk about this later um, when we talk about terror. Um, but what's really is like, if you see the fact that the state is now beating people up, putting people into prison for long periods of time, or you know loads of people who have been beaten up, you're more likely just to try and keep a low profile. And that is conformity. And Hitler is aiming for conformity, particularly amongst the left. So the part of the reason Hitler doesn't try and arrest every single SPD member is that there's loads of them. And if every single SPD member feels that they're actually under threat, they might turn against him. If, however, Hitler targets the leadership only, the others will hopefully keep their heads down keep their mouth shut and just hope they don't get tarnished themselves which is what happens and so this this sort of use of violence is extreme and it's brutal but it's calibrated it's not against all enemies there's a lot of people who don't like um weimar as i don't like hitler such as many catholics who are completely left alone um this is about sending a message and creating an atmosphere of conformity through targeted selective terror and you might want to answer why have the communists not been able to do about anything about this why do they not unite with the socialists um in part, essentially, their um, tactic was to do nothing and wait. The Communist Party were following orders from Stalin. Stalin did not want to antagonize the Nazis in order to start a war. In addition, those communists tend to follow a very structured, very um, uh, with scientific model of communism. They say they believe communism is science, and therefore, what they say is, well, logically, what happen what happens is you have the cap, you have feudal phase, and that's overthrown by the capitalists, and that's the capitalist bourgeois phase. And now, this is a good evidence that the capitalism is in its death throes. Capitalism is on its way out, and all we need to do is wait. Um, because you only have a someone like Hitler if capitalism is on its last legs. And so if we wait, then the, that government will fail, just like every other government of Brüning, von Papen, Schleicher. And then it was our time. Now, this is a very self-serving, a very, very fatalist sort of position. That ends up not working. Um, in part, though, it was also hard for them to react because if they um, uh, did too much, it really all it did was... Um, uh, reinforce this image that oh there is definitely a communist uprising and therefore they'll give Nazis more legitimacy in addition the, Nazi, the communists themselves for reasons that we've seen before are really poorly divided are really really poorly led they are very poorly organized and they're full of as much fighting amongst themselves about n n minute areas of policy and minute areas of ideology as anything else and so the communist party really can't react they do fight back in some cases but it's not effective and this really helps Hitler because by, by the fact that the communists are not very good at fighting back it makes this we're going to crack down the communists look really effective makes Hitler look really competent um so if you're basically fighting someone who is not paying attention not and not fighting back really i was too poorly organized to fight back um you look like you're doing really well and they look really bad if you're fighting someone who's organized and fights back you look weak and so actually it really helps hitler the fact that the communists are quite weak and in addition it helps the fact that the the kpd and the spd fail to unify now in reality historians have given both sides a hard time for not unifying but it's very unlikely that the unification was likely to work the reason being um is because there's so much ideological difference between the very moderate very gradualist not really that communist or socialist SPD and the revolutionary socialist and revolutionary communist KPD. Um, everything from the use of force in the Bavarian, Ruhr and Berlin uprisings in the early 1920s, the use of Article 48 to justify the murder of Karl Liebknecht and Rosen Luxemburg in the early 1920s, and the, con the view that the SPD were almost a conspiracy to try and keep the masses docile that often communists have of the centre-left, um, meant that there's just because both have socialism somewhere, you know, contain their title or communism doesn't mean they're actually that similar and they hate um, the hatred that they have for the Nazis is only really matched by the hatred they have for each other and therefore there's no real chance of a unity and so what we have is a massive crackdown on the left without any real response due to incompetence due to a failure to recognize how, how grave a threat it is and due to a mutual antagonism to trust between them we know that Hitler comes to power because of a um, uh, because we now have hindsight they do not have that. They do not know that. And so we go into the elections in 1933 um, with um, uh, Hitler's band. Hitler is the one who takes power and then immediately deals with the Communist Party. The if, a very important thing to remember on this is the Communist Party is officially banned as part of the um, law for the protection of the public. So the German people. Um, and therefore, if you, in a system of forced representation, if you slice out 
15% of the votes, everyone else gets proportionally more votes. So you have a certain amount of electors, let's say, if you have, let's say for the sake of argument, you have 100 seats, it says 288 there, but just say to make it easy to explain, and 20 of those seats traditionally go to the communists. If you wipe out the communists, if you remove the communist party from being able to run, it means that those people, those votes won't count, or if those people usually won't go to the vote. And therefore, if you get, if you got twenty percent of the vote this um, last time, then you're going to get proportionally more, twenty four percent of the vote, um, because now you've got twenty percent less fewer voters, twenty percent fewer um, uh, people, uh, parties uh, involved, and therefore there's have there's twenty percent more seats to gain without any change there. So what we see is we see uh, number one the the availability of seats increases, and therefore hit the Nazis will naturally do better as. Um, we see the SA is also increasing ramping up its intimidation not that much it doesn't force people to the polls but it's you know it heavily suggests particularly in, amongst communities and areas where it can people go to the polls uh, and through this and through the violence the Nazis secure 43.9 percent of the vote this is not enough um, he only just squeaks a minority by getting the DNVP to be their coalition partner and therefore this gives this DNP a lot of power because at any point the DNP can go well let's just go away this is nowhere near the two-thirds majority. Without this two-thirds majority, Hitler's plan to give himself unlimited power, to give himself an enabling act, to give himself, make himself a dictator, will not work. He has to change tact. And so in the end, what he decides is he needs to, rather than all at once in a course of basically a month, giving himself lots and lots of power, he needs to more slowly, evenly, slowly give himself some power, usually justifying it as a mean, as something necessary to fight the communists, not because he's Hitler, because people don't, obviously people don't, the majority don't like that Hitler is Hitler. Um, and he needs to uh, do this with the support of the people who can give him this power, i.e. Hindenburg, i.e. the elite, i.e. the Reichstag, i.e. his own party. And so what he does is he realizes if he needs the elites, he needs to show that he is still their man. He needs to show that he is following them. And that was the day of Potsdam. The day of Potsdam is this huge propaganda day organized by Goebbels, which officially had nothing to do with the Nazi party. Hitler even wore a suit. It was a celebration of Potsdam is in Prussia, Prussian values, the Prussian history, the Prussian people. And he had... Um, um, him, and what he was doing here is essentially by having this huge parade where Hitler was a second. Hitler was the one bowing his head and shaking the hand of Hindenburg. It was all about loyalty. It was all about Prussianness. Hitler is trying to make amends for the slight antagonism he had caused the elites and the conservatives and the DMPs by his violence up until this date. The unrestricted violence of the SA, which had been happening in the first few months. Um, but also to try and reassure the elites that he is one of them. And basically it's this huge pageant and parade which is about submission. The fact that Hitler is in service of the Prussians. Hitler is in service of the elites. And if you feel free to Google Dea Potsdam, you'll just see countless pictures of Hitler being subservient and lots and lots of army and Hindenburg in positions of significance and powers. This is a huge analysis and a huge emphasis um, towards um, the submission of the, um, uh, the state and submission of the sort of people of Germany um, uh, who in general rather than just pro-Nazism and so this is a very clever and canny political move as Hitler's re very quickly realized that his first route to power just getting the two-thirds majority and then winging it um, isn't working so he is now trying to buy people off against this whole backdrop he's carrying on this idea that Hitler is under threat more importantly Germany is under threat from the Communist Party and this is really ramped up in its rhetoric and is really encouraged and this is because he's working towards um, uh, sort of legitimizing violence. Uh, first thing what we have is Dachau, the concentration camp, is um, built. Um, uh, about 10,000 10, people put into correct trust. The, most of them were communists. Um, and essentially, we see a, a more tidy, more state sponsored, more organized repression. Up until this point, it's been SA men going around putting people in basins, beating them up. And this has meant that some quote unquote innocent um, uh, civilians were caught in the crossfire, often sometimes communists, people who's got in the way, and some even conservatives got beaten up or something even got put in these, um, these basins until they were released when someone realized the mistake that had been made. 
he increasingly moves to SS based terror. This is far more, if you remember the SS, far more regimented, far more disciplined. Uh, and Dachau is a real symbol of this because it really shows that the terror is becoming more organized, becoming a bigger scale, but also more structured, less chaotic. He realizes that the violence of the SA and their beating up of random people throughout this period, something we're going to talk about in the next session. Um, uh, it really um, is just too too bad for the uh, the country and it's not enough good enough for the um, uh, uh, the elite's partners and therefore he needs to rein it in um, and so this terror from below that the SA had been doing um, uh, was clearly not enough in and of itself um, and therefore the SA increasingly take the control now f just a quick note on the terror from below uh, the terror from below is a way that you describe the fact that a lot of this terror that's happening is SA men taking it among themselves to sort of beat up and attack random people who they think are bad and they could off they're usually communists or socialists but it could be pretty much anyone if you remember against the backdrop of Bamberg the SA have increasingly become more rebellious and resentful towards what they call the right and the southern wing i.e the hitler changing it towards nationalism and um, hitler in order to get mass votes had shifted a lot of the nazi platform away from the stuff in the 25 points and away from even some stuff in Mein Kampf, particularly the more socialist side of stuff and there this leads to increasing dissatisfaction so the sa is in no real mood to really follow party orders so when hitler tells the sa you need to obey you need to do what you say what i say and so on they're not really following it and that's why it's important for hitler to increasingly make get the ss involved um, into these sort of stuff so what we see is Hitler is slowly building towards the enabling law. Um, the enabling bill, enabling law, is essentially Hitler giving himself the power of Article 48 alongside Hindenburg for the next four years. The idea is that this would mean that you you don't it would destroy parliamentary democracy. The Reichstag is pointless because you can pass his own law. Why would you bother going for the Reichstag if you can pass a law yourself? For this, however, he will need a two-thirds majority. He had 51% of the votes. To get the um, uh, support necessary, the KPD ba deputies were banned, so um, they couldn't um, take their seats. So fine, that makes it slightly easier to get two thirds, because it's two thirds of whoever is in the Reichstag, I, or the posh word for that is the quorum, um, the two thirds of quorum, and the SPD would not vote for you. But the SPD have slightly less than one third of the votes. So if Hitler can get the other parties to support an enabling bill, then he could get the enabling law and therefore the center port sorry center party was necessary hitler goes out of his way in these few months to try and make himself look legal make him really hype up the communist threat and if you read his speech and it's really good it's on the wikipedia for um uh, the enabling act he makes constant reference to the atheistic communists who, in the, in the Russian Revolution, destroyed churches, destroyed the unique culture of the German Christian people, really laying it thick about the threat of communism and associating his submission to the Catholics. Um, and this is really, really important. This is, again, Hitler playing to the communist centre party. Now, many people question, why do the Centre Party agree to this? Why do the Centre Party go along with it? Well, in reality, there's a massive argument between two people. There's someone called Gatz, and there is someone called um, Bruning. Gatz is saying, we should go first, and Bruning is saying, we shouldn't. And there's this huge argument within the Centre Party um, about um, uh, whether Hitler can be trusted. Katz wins the argument, and his argument is we share a lot of values, um, social conservatism, anti-communism, with the Communist Party. In addition, um, um, Hitler had agreed to what we call a concordat. A concordat is an agreement between a government and the Pope. A concordat is usually, as Mussolini had also had a concordat, who was also a fascist in Italy, which basically said, we leave you alone, church, so long as you don't get involved in politics. And if you remember, the Centre Party, it came into power came into existence in reaction to something called culture camp in the 1870s culture camp was when the uh, german state under bismarck tried to remove catholicism from germany that failed but the center party was built as a means to get people in the right stack who could definitely try and stop anything from happening in the future i.e the center party was less about making germany catholic it was more about protecting the German Catholicism and to a lesser extent Protestantism, particularly in the South. So with that mentality, they think they always Cass's argument is what's what will help what will better help protect 
Catholicism in Germany. Either going head to head with it, the Nazis, we know what they're capable of, or making friends with them, going along with them, and then getting this concordant which keeps us safe. And Katz wins the argument, and therefore, because of loyalty and party discipline, the other members, including Brüning, vote for it as well. Um, and so, therefore, Hitler, the vote enabling it was passed by a no vote of 444 votes to 94 of the SPD. And therefore, the Weimar Germany essentially committed suicide. It voted the Reichstag out of existence. Hitler could now pass any law he wanted by decree. It is important to remember that this is not still not absolute power. The army holds their power. The elites hold their power. Hindenburg has his own Article 48. This um, uh, law only exists for four years as a result of emergency. In theory, there could still be a revolution. So why the and that all serves to reassure people like Hindenburg and the army that this is not Hitler coming to complete power. They still believe they hold the power. They've just given Hitler more tools to deal with the communists that they hate. And so we can look at this, and because we know that Hitler will use this with reckless abandoning to create a dictatorship, but this is very much Hitler using his skills, the, the opposition misreading Hitler, and hit, uh, and the fact that many uh, of the elites think that they still have control. If worse comes worse, Hindenburg could say Hitler has removed the chancellor, job done. Uh, and if Hitler says no you can't who which side is Yama going to take it's of course going to be Hindenburg so there's a reassurance particularly amongst the elites less so obviously amongst the left um, that Hitler is um, uh, being contained and this is just something to help him deal with the Communist Party there is a series of other moves he takes um, uh, in the 1st of April um, he boycotts there's a one day Jewish shop boycott interestingly the SA wants to boycott forever um, all Jewish businesses whereas um, the Minister of Finance uh, Schacht demands that there be no boycott um, because he's trying to re repair the economy and that's clearly not working um, and so if you if you make if you reduce the demand on a large chunk of German businesses, that's only going to hurt the um, situation. And so this becomes a one-day boycott in a classic sort of Hitlerist compromise between the two groups. This is Hitler trying to keep his SA and his left happy so he doesn't get removed for his own party, but also trying to keep, keep the economy going because he knows the only thing that gets him legitimacy more than anything else is the fact that he is a um, person who is dealing with communists and dealing with the other major threat, which is the um, economy. Secondly, he then moves with the law of restoration of civil service. The Jews and aliens, aliens defined as racial but also political, um, were removed from the civil service. Civil service um, didn't just mean the people in the high-up offices in Berlin. This meant many people in the in the railways, in the police, in the um, to some extent in certain elements of education who were Jews and politically suspect. Now, Hindenburg demanded. Um, Jews who had served in World War One be exempt, and obviously Hitler doesn't have the power to overrule Hindenburg, so that happens. So only five percent of people are purged. Only the five percent of civil service are purged from this, and it's probably more people who are sort of left wing in their tendencies or Jewish in the civil service. But what this does is really send a message to the government. The civil, the civil service are the people who do what the Nazis want. This says this really sends a message that we can fire you if we think that you are a quote unquote alien. And this really helps get that atmosphere of conformity amongst these people who are now increasingly scared for their jobs because of what they just, just happened here. Um, and so while this is rather negligible from a perspective of, say, um, uh, getting complete control of the German people, this helps Hitler get the people who are going to be enacting his laws to be more loyal and at least be more conformist, or at least on the surface, doing what he says. And that's very important for getting stuff done. It helps reduce the threat of them civil service have to him. He seizes the trade unions, um, uh, the um, ADB, G, so ADGB, is like the TUC um, Trade Unions Congress, which is basically the Union of Unions. And so basically it's the organization which creates and coordinates all the unions. Their offices are ransacked, seized, trade, um, burnt, um, in, it, in some parts burns around the printing press, but basically it's completely closed down to reduce the ability to coordinate. Uh, many um, uh, trade unions are killed in this process, particularly if they resist. For example, in Duisburg, in the Ruhr, um, so again, we see another avenue for the left to organise and resist um, removed. 
the big thing about the left is they have the quantity, but without the ability to coordinate and organize and inspire, you are the ability to use those quantity of people is just far, far less likely to happen. And the seizure of trade union is a real design to get this done. Now Hitler justifies this by saying they're communist fronts, they are they pretend to be non communist, but they are communist, and most conservatives are happy to go along with it. In fact, the industrials quite like this because they hate trade unions, because trade unions hurt their bottom line. Um, However, at the same time, in June, um, Hitler also starts really pushing for reco economic recovery. Borrowing Keynesian ideas, first used by Mussolini, then used by, um, hit, uh, by FDR, um, he starts using public work schemes to reduce unemployment. It's very important that Hitler um, does this because this will give him some legitimacy. And the Great Depression, which has already actually hit its worst point in uh, December 1932, and it was improving globally from this point, so Hitler benefits massively from the circumstances circumstance when it comes to power um, uh, is definitely accelerated by these schemes and this is the idea that essentially if people don't have jobs they don't have money in their pocket they can't spend it on local businesses those local businesses fail they fire people because they can't afford as many workers or they close those people don't have money in pockets and it gets worse and worse this is called the multiplier multiplier effect really crudely um, the idea here is if we stimulate demand by by using public loans, public funds to get money in people's pockets, they will both have jobs that will uh, mean that they can spend money, um, but also they're doing something productive. But that will also stimulate demand from their local businesses. And if they're building roads, concrete manufacturers, spade manufacturers and so on, which will stimulate demand, stimulate, um, therefore mean that you have to employ more people, which means that you stimulate more demand because there's more people with money in their pockets. And therefore, there's a positive multiplier effect. Um, he, this is very important. Hitler. He needs to get support of the masses. He needs to get legitimacy from um, the elites. And if he can show that he can solve the Great Depression, where several um, governments had already failed, from Müller to Brüning to Schleicher to von Papen, he will give himself a degree of legitimacy, which in reality sees him through until at least 1943. Um, he also then moves on to pass the, the law against the establishment of the parties. Um, essentially, um, he bans all political parties from existing. Now, this sounds like, why would people go along with this? Well, the KPD was already banned. The SPD didn't want to be banned, but they were banned. And you can, they politically can be, because most people in Germany didn't like the SPD, because they saw them as a front as of the Communist Party. Uh, so the SPD was officially banned on the 22nd of June. The Nationalist Party, the DNVP, disbanded themselves on the 5th of July on suggestion of Hitler. Now, many people go, why would they do this? They've lost their power. Well, Number one, the Reichstag doesn't matter anymore because the, of the Reichstag fire decree. So there's no point of having a party for the Reichstag because it doesn't matter. More than that, the DNVP itself, its power was never in the DNVP. The DNVP was a political wing of, the, like the policy political party wing, and, I, and a very small supported one, of the elites. The elite's power comes from the fact they control the army, they control the civil service, they control local government, they control the police, they control the industry and the land. Just because you lose your little political party, which is always there just because you, you had to be there rather than because you wanted to be in democracy, um, doesn't mean they lose anything. And they see it as a fair trade, like, they're, they're, why would we keep this pointless party when we can just keep having our, exerting our influence behind the scenes as we've been doing? And that's where most of our influence came otherwise. The Catholic party, the centre party, um, uh, also followed suit because in reality its concordat was coming up and part of the concordat was that the Catholic party had to disband and similar to those arguments that Cass was making that the Catholics will be better protected if they're inside the tent um, I, if they're with the Nazis and they follow suit um, than if they're outside because they're not, the Catholics see well what's the point of having this party anymore it, it, we, there's no Reichstag, it doesn't do anything we will remain Catholics, we still ha can organise ourselves for the churches all we do by keeping a Catholic centre party is we make it hard to have the concordat with Rome, harder to have this promise from Hitler that he will leave the Catholics alone in return for us going out of politics and so the Catholic party followed suit once the major parties, the KPD SPD and Nationalists and the Catholic party a centre party had been completely removed it's very easy for Hitler then to um, pass the law against the establishment of parties to ban all other parties because they themselves have basically between them less than 8% of the vote. So Hitler essentially had now got a one party state as a result of this. This is a, due to capitulation, um, better strategies, and uh, misreading of situations by those parties, um, and in some cases, the use of terror. Hitler then signed the Reichskonkordat, which is um, often called the Concordat of Rome. Essentially, they this is a trade between the Pope and thus the Catholics and uh, 
um, Hitler. And this is modelled entirely and explicitly on the Contorda of Rome um, that uh, Mussolini in Italy made several years before. And essentially it was, we will let you do what you want. We will not interfere with churches. We will not do, we'll not challenge the churches. In return, you will not organise politically or get involved in any politics. This suits the Catholics um, fine. Because in reality, Catholicism has a history of 2,000 years. Well, at this point, 1,933 years. Um, and it has seen dictators before. It survived kings. It survived emperors. It sees Hitler as a flash in the pan. The more important thing is that religion survives. Even if it has to go quieter for a little bit, it will see. It sees itself as existing far longer than the Nazi party. Um, in addition, they realise that um, the... Um, uh, there's not much to be gained from the political activity if they have their religious freedom. Remember, that they got involved in politics in the first place to defend themselves. This is better. To, this is them defending themselves. And so if defending themselves means they don't have a party anymore, or they don't campaign politically anymore, that's fine. Their, pro, their end, their me, the, the party is a means to an end, not an end in itself. I, the end is keeping Catholicism alive. And so in reality, um, uh, it makes no real sense for them to not sign this concordat. But what does Hitler sign it? Two thirds of the German population concentrated in the South, highly organised, highly loyal to the Pope, highly suspicious of Nazis, are live in his country. They are a real threat, but they are highly organised. They are highly loyal to their priests, to their bishops and to the Pope. They are a huge threat that Hitler can't actually clamp down on. He can clamp down on the communists because they're weak, they're divided and everyone hates them. The Catholics on the hand are a far bigger population, far more organised and also far more popular. Even amongst the little Junkers, they would be quite suspicious. They're, Junkers are happy if you were attacking communists. They're a bit more suspicious about you attacking Catholics. They won't allow it. And so Hitler has to find a way to basically quieten down the Catholics while at the same time um, getting them in line. This is a brilliant thing. So the Reich Concordat is a win for both sides. And in reality, Hitler's going to have, there's going to be several situations where Hitler would love to, to crack down on the, um, uh, the churches, crack, crack down on the priests. And he can't. And we're going to look at that when we look at the terror for the next um, uh, session. Uh, it's the next uh, essay. Um, but yeah, he really can't afford it. On the 14th of October, the Reichstag is therefore subsequently devolved. Oh, there's no major parties, there's no point of it anymore. And then we have elections, um, which is essentially elections to a consultative um, assembly, which doesn't even meet, which 92% won um, by the Nazis. Um, the 8% are usually spoiled ballots or writing candidates who were non-Nazis. This was not an election that had any difference whatsoever. All it did was... Um, uh, it was being used to serve as a propaganda tool to show how popular the Nazis are and therefore to encourage an atmosphere of conformity. These are often described therefore as plebiscites as opposed to elections. Plebiscites are more like referendums um, rather than anything else. Um, in addition, in the 30th of um, January, he creates a law for the reconstruction of the state, which basically re re um, replaces all the state governments, the local land tags and so on, which were controlled by, had their own little parliaments and therefore there was still democracy around with Gau the Gauleiters that, if you remember from the Bamberg Conference, Hitler had appointed to run each section. And so this is about removing the last vestiges of democracy, because even if you remove the Reichstag, it, there are various places like uh, Prussia, well not Prussia, Prussia, the Russian, Prussian coup, uh, like Bavaria, which have land tags, have regional assemblies, like um, local councils, the thing, the thing like the Scottish Parliament or like the, the uh, mayoral assembly in London. Um, uh, they are now removed and replaced by people hand-picked and hand-loyal to um, Hitler. And so Hitler, by and large, has completed a large degree of control over the apparatus of the state, i.e. the Reichstag, the civil service, and the organisation. He has less control, however, over his own party. He has less control over the masses. He has less control over the elites. In comes the night long nights. The SA have been a problem. They have always been left-leaning. They've always been sort of the Berlin branch, the northern branch, a bit more radical, a bit more obedient to their own leaders than, the, than that of Hitler. And therefore, they've always not really followed orders, particularly at, during the 1930s as they increasingly see the, the Nazi party take a more moderate, take a more right-wing line as they try and appeal to the elites and the masses. And you remember that from the uh, consul the, uh, consul the, not the changes in the 1920s lesson. Uh, to me, one of the most important factors why Nazis come to power. And so Hitler keeps them 
like keeps them in line by saying when we come to power don't worry this is a pretend when we come to power i'm going to have this revolution that i promised and this just about keeps them in line there's like lots of people not following orders and so on and so on but for those all intents and purposes keeps them in line the essay however once they once hitler comes to power now start going so uh where's this revolution and hitler keeps them trying to buy them off but increasingly they start being suspicious that hitler will never bring this revolution increasingly they go in their own sort of um uh, world and increasingly therefore they can get distant from the party leadership and hitler and therefore we see the rise of the terror from below which is where the essay almost take it upon themselves without orders from the center well it is debated whether there's orders from the center but generally without orders from the center on the micro level um it's just to beat random people up and to arrest them who they think are bad and this creates alarm from the average german citizen and the average elite that this violence is going beyond the political acceptable the elites and the masses are happy for the SA to kick in communists. But when the communists start beating up police officers who intervene, they start hitting, um, beating up Catholics who condemn the, um, uh, the Nazis. They start attacking uh, c uh, conservatives or middle classes. They are worried. They become worried about the violence. Always remember that these people are not scared of violence. They're scared of, they're scared of the violence when it's targeted on them. In the same way I mentioned before that if um, we had today a concentration camps, people but they were for paedophiles i would contend that the average british person would probably be fine with that um uh, so it's not the concentration it's not the violence it's who it's targeted against which is fine um and therefore what we see is a um a, this increasing view that the sa is a problem the sa is this dog which needs to be put on a leash this is made worse than when in january 1934 a memorandum um is made a memo is made by the sa which make it clear that they want to replace the army they um they want to they want to replace the army and make it a people's or a volks army a volks fort militia um they have three million members the army because of the treaty of versailles has a hundred thousand this is really really scary to the army and the army see this and they find this out very quickly and increasingly get worried that they are going to be replaced um this um when combined with the increasing disdain of hitler the increasing refusing to follow orders and the almost deliberate attack on the wrong people increasingly creates problems for the s um for hitler internally in, in addition um, individuals start worrying that rom is getting too much power and people like goering himmler goebbels start positioning themselves against rom suggesting that rom is banned that rom is trying to seize power and so on um yeah, in addition um the uh, Mussolini ends up being persuaded um, by the diplomatic elite, the, dip the German foreign ministry is con completely controlled by Junkers, that the SA are doing damage to Germany's reputation and start telling Hitler that um, he needs to get rain the SA in. Um, this comes to a head in something called the Marburg speech. By this point, the SA have been beating people up, the army is getting dissatisfied and from Papan, you might remember, he is still the vice chancellor, um, who has been quiet up to this point, sees his chance. And, he, and in this speech, written by two of his aides, he basically, without explicitly saying it, says, unless the SA is brought into line, the elites will have to do something about it, i.e. remove Hitler and have a separate coup. This is terrifying for Hitler. The, the elites moving against him on the base of the SA would destroy him and could easily happen because they have the guns. And so this, combined with the fact that Himmler, always the sneaky one, sees his opportunity to go from the situation which is currently where the SS is subordinate to the SA, i.e. it belongs to the SA, to the SS controls the SA, provokes a file which suggests that the SA is trying to, I should say leader of the SS, um, um, is trying to um, uh, seize power. He suggests that Rom is trying to get try and make a revolution. In addition, um, the uh, there are many historians have argued by this point that the Hitler got as much as he can from the terror from below. The terror from below was great for getting an atmosphere of conformity. By mid 1934, that atmosphere of conformity exists. Dachau exists. We don't need it anymore. We almost want to go back to normalcy. So Hitler is looking at a situation where the SA is increasingly going out of line. They're increasingly causing him problems. The 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 elites look like they're about to mutiny. Um, it he, Hitler's getting faked, but still credible evidence from Himmler that. Um, that he believes that the um, SS are the SA are seeking to um, uh, seize power, and the SA have served their purpose, and so Hitler decides he's going to move against them. He decides in a night of long knives to assassinate the leadership 
of the SA. The SA might have three million men, but like the masses, without effective coordination and leadership, um, they won't know what to do. And essentially in one night, um, a large chunk such as Ernst, Felt, and most importantly the leader of the SA, Ernst Rom, are killed. Uh, this is, um, they are gunned down without trial, and they are, most in most cases, uh, killed by the SS, because obviously the SS sees this as a great opportunity to become the leading political force and violence in Germany, which they do. However, this is also used to target non-SA political opponents. Jung and Bose were both Papen's friends who wrote the Marburg speech offer. These men were murdered to send a message to von Papen. Now, I can't murder you, von Papen, because you are a member of the elite and you are someone important. But I can murder your, your insignificant friends. From this point, von Papen gets the message and gets very quiet. Um, people like Eric Kass Kassner and Albert Props, who are individuals who are in charge of the Catholic leadership organisations, but no, but not ones that are religious. I, they're part of like the youth groups and the charity groups, which rather than being part of the church per, per se. And those these people are murdered because they of their public opposition to the Nazis. Um, Gregor Strasser, who is a member of the left, the Nazi Party, but not of the SA, and Kurt von Schleicher, who remember. Um, from La and his wife as well actually um, who remember from um, the last um, chance before Hitler comes to power and some such as Von Kahr who betrayed him during the um, uh, the uh, Munich Putsch back in the early 1920s and Bollestet who um, uh, who made a complaint against Hitler in 1921 um, which got Hitler put in prison for a little period of time um, um, they were just killed for pure on revenge now, you might be saying, well, how did Hitler get away with this? How did he get away with killing people who weren't the SA? Hitler controls the media. Hitler controls what messages are said. Hitler con is, has controls the censorship. And through Goering, there's a masterpiece of propaganda where he, they publicise this. And they really add in the fact that certain individuals were found in the companies of young boys and young men um, and really paint the SA as this sort of corrupt, sort of ho uh, homosexual um paying to worse prejudices of the uh sort of nazi and german people um and um but also suggest that this was part of a general conspiracy that the SA had conspired with these other people such as young klausner strasser and schleicher a very un implausible coalition but one well, nonetheless um which um uh, a coalition which ends up um almost destroying, uh, looking to destroy the German state and try and bring in a SA sort of von Schleicher co coalition. This is something which in reality um, is impossible and did not exist. But in between the fact that there's no other information that can contend against this because censorship, the fact that they're, they're, the propaganda is relentless and huge, and the fact, to be honest, most German people are just happy that the SA has been put into line. They're more willing to go, okay, we'll give, we'll give you a chance. This really buys the masses, the German masses. You think, oh, people will be sad that Hitler just murdered a bunch of people. He's murdered a bunch of people that the people are scared of. He's only popular, he gets more popular as a result of this. And this helps him in two ways. This deals with the threat from his party. This basically creates an atmosphere of conformity with his party, deals with the threat of the SA, and basically means he, he has slightly more control of those people. In, real, in addition, it, it stems the flow of... Um, blood that he has from um, fear of the elites and gets Hindenburg and the generals um, in uh, uh, sort of on side a bit more and conciliates them. Um, they're more willing to have Hitler in power and support him in power as this continues. It also, as a side note, brings Himmler to be the most important um, member of the coercive, i.e. the violent arm of the Nazi party. Um, this is where the SS starts becoming important, and the SS will play a massive role in the next two um, lessons to come. Next two, sorry, essays to come. And so Night of Long Knives is this fantastic play. You can say, well, why doesn't Hitler deal with this sooner? The, the essay are a problem from February 1933. Well, we're going to look at it in more detail. Um, but essentially, it's because Hitler isn't actually that decisive a leader until he is put under threat, pressure or he is forced to make a decision. Then he acts quite decisively, such as this. So, No Long Knives is a great example of Hitler conciliating the elites and also dealing with a problem on his left of his party and getting control of his party. This is all combined with the attack. Uh, sorry, topped with the death of Hindenburg on the um, uh, the uh, August 1934. Hindenburg was almost a rallying point. He was the one who could organise very disparate members of the elite, the Junkers in the provinces of, the, of, Bavaria, um, of 
uh, or P Prussia, the army, the local police chiefs, the industrialists, and so on and so on and so on and so on. He dies uh, of natural causes, um, uh, and we see a law as he is dying. We see the law in the first of August, the law concerning the head of the state of the German Reich, which basically says we are combining the um, role of chancellor and the role of president into one role, Führer. This removes a massive check on the Nazis. If you remember previously, one of the things that reassured the elites constantly was the fact that if in doubt, uh, if Hitler goes out of line, Hin um, Hindenburg could use his Article 48 powers to um, uh, counteract the law or could use his powers present to remove the Chancellor. This means that there's now no one overseeing and oversighting um, the Chancellor and therefore removes that check. Um, the counterweight for Article 48, therefore, is removed. Um, in addition, the person who can organize the various institutions, the police, the army, and so on, against um, the uh, Hitler, uh, in, order, in, in addition, rally the traditional elites and organize them as a figurehead, has gone. If you remember, we've been talking for out about the fact that people themselves being angry isn't enough to threaten the government. They have to have someone to organize them. They have to have someone to rally them. They have to have someone to rally around. By losing Hindenburg, the elites lose that, and therefore they are still a threat. If you are going to take on the army, they will fight back. But there's someone who's less able to sort of combine them with the, the, um, uh, the civil service, the police, and so on, and therefore reduces the elites in general's coordination and therefore threat, and therefore means they're like less threatening and less important. Um, and therefore, while um, it, is, it is something which therefore limits the power of the elites, the elites still have their power, by all means, but it, it's going to be harder for them to use it now they don't have that figurehead. Hitler can get away with a little bit more before then people unite against him. Um, on the death of Hindenburg, um, uh, the army swear an oath of loyalty to him as a new Führer. And that's why this essay is, this lesson is called Chancellor to Führer. Um, and you must remember that although this is very sad and very bad for the um, uh, political situation, Hindenburg by the end was a senile old man who really didn't understand what was going around him. Uh, and we can't, don't overblow how big a change this is. It isn't like you have someone who's constantly checking Hitler who suddenly dies. This is someone who exists as almost an image rather than a functional person. I think like late Reagan, um, as opposed to um, uh, someone who actually has a lot of power and is actually doing anything. And so Hindenburg's death means that we're in a situation where um, the Hitler still does not have a free hand, but he has a much freer hand than he did before. This is against the background, finally, of Glashautung, which is coordination, where Hitler essentially says, I want to do two things. I want to remove potential sites of opposition and remove civil society. Sites of opposition are things which organizations or groups where people can get together and say in secret in safety let's organize against the government in addition civil society is existence of bodies which are not controlled by the government which allows you to express views which aren't official government views these could be anything from trade unions to um, uh, social clubs to sports clubs to um, newspapers uh, to discussion groups to uh, lecture series Gershautung throughout this period has been going on closing down non-Nazi trade unions, non-Nazi uh, lecture series, non-Nazi sporting groups, and replacing them with official Nazi ones. By replacing them with official Nazi ones, people can still go and play football. That's fine. But now that it belongs to Nazis, you are more worried about expressing your opposition, that site's opposition, because you don't know who's listening. You don't know who's going to report it to the Gestapo, the secret police, and you don't know who's, who's going to grasp you up. And therefore, this presents, prevents opposition, um, but also it means that um, those organisations which could previously be used um, and would often discuss or, or encourage ideas outside of official Nazi ideas, now, because they're controlled by the Nazi party, will completely suggest and push only Nazi ideas, and therefore removes the abilities to explore ideas other than Nazi values, such as Volkswagen, Schaft, and so on, um, 
away from the masses. And so while coordination is not vital to sort of make people completely obey, it reduces their chance to oppose. It provides leverage because I can always kick you out of this particular um, union. Therefore, you'll lose your job. I could always say, well, you can't. We will close down this this social group. And therefore, we've got nothing to do. We can bar you from this particular bar and so on. And also, it gives an opportunity to spread the Nazi message into people's lives beyond just newspapers because you'll be going to a Nazi football club and at the same time, you'll still be having to do the, the Nazi salute and um, sing certain songs, which would be helpful for trying to provide indoctrination. You can also use those as a means to send messages. A good examples are the Hitler Youth or Youth Movements are closed down, apart from certain um, uh, church based ones, and um, the German Deutsche Arbeit in front, which is the um, uh, replacement for the German unions. Uh, um, they are now into the German Workers uh, Front and the German Lawyers Front, which is all like the, the, the what could be called a union. It's more like a professional organization or association of lawyers, which used to independently discuss issues, used to independently organize themselves, was replaced by the German Lawyers Front, controlled by the Nazis. Therefore, there's less discussion about whether stuff the Nazi state was doing was illegal or illegal. And therefore, we see that um, the Xiaotong, um increasingly means that institutions where people could discuss and become a site of opposition and have ideas where people um, opposites or are different to Nazis were increasingly removed. Arguably, this was balanced through stuff such as Strength Through Joy and Winter Hill, stuff we're going to discuss later, um, but basically nice stuff that Nazis give people to try and encourage people to still remain part of these things. Um, but by and large, most people will see what's going on, but have no means to complain about it, or it's not really important enough to complain. So we are going to look at the paragraphs, which is how does he do this next video lesson? For now, though, um, if we have a look at wh where he is and how much he ha power he has now compared to at the start, he pretty much has improved his situation. The left and unions, his own party, Hindenburg and the Reichstag, are completely removed as real threats. Um, there, he has got increased control over the, ser the, ch the church, the masses, civil service, and von Papen. Although they still have um, means to move um, uh, and do their own thing. Uh, so they're not under complete control, but they're under more control. The army elites, there's nothing been done to really get more power over them. Although they have been bought off a bit more for a series of rearmaments and uh, pot stamps and gestures such as the long knives. So Hitler has definitely um, paved the way from Chancellor to Fuhrer, a very distinct legal term which comes at the death of Hindenburg in 1934. 1934 is a key, key date. If you ever see, want to see if a question is, why did Hitler come to power? Why did Hitler come consolidate power um, and therefore um, the um, uh, he has basically across all groups improved his power somewhat it's very important going into the next essay you realize that this is not complete power the next essay is how does he remain in power when you don't when you look at this chart and every single thing is not green you have to do more than just rely on people to do what they told you have to buy them off, you have to manipulate them, you have to get them to conform you can't just use terror and that is a cornerstone of the next essay Okay, one final note, please, please, please remember, this is the narrative, what happens, this is your evidence, this is not the paragraphs, the S is, why is he able to get away with this, or how far is this successful, and so what we do is, if you're doing it, how far is it successful, you look at these groups, and how far he's got control over them, if you are doing, how is he able to get away with it, which is the most common question, terror was the main means Hitler was able to consolidate power, how far do you agree, for example, you go, well, paragraph one, terror, um, he uses terror, for example, to crush the left through the law for the preservation of the state. Also crush his own party, not long knives. However, he also uses propaganda, for example, blah, blah, blah. And so that is the key thing going into this. I, every time I set this essay, I have at least one person give me paragraph one enabling act. You should never, ever, ever have paragraphs led by enabling act. Okay, uh, until the next video, I will see you then.